Okay, if you could please take your seats. Are you, is that working? No. Hello? Yeah, that works. Testing, okay, testing. we are about testing. to Ooh. kick off with solidarity, testing. not solutionism. Fantastic. I don't know why that was funny. <laughs> are you laughing at me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I believe you. Um, okay, welcome Hello. back, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to kick off now with solidarity, not solutionism, and I am going to pass over to Becky Kazansky to introduce this panel. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Becky Kazansky, and um, I am here today uh, as part of a really great group of people who um, are mostly joining us from all sorts of different geographic regions of the world. Hello. I'm going to be awkwardly looking up at them in this uh, hybrid uh, um, format experiment. So uh, please um, bear with us as we uh, make uh, our, our a playful time of this, um, this really great way to actually hear from voices uh, from all over today. Um, this panel uh, is kind of a follow-on to a workshop that just happened, uh, which began to explore um, environmental and climate justice as a digital rights issue. Um, this panel now is going to be focusing on the idea of um, false solutions for climate and false tech solutions uh, in particular. Um, just a word about myself. Um, I am here on behalf of an organization called The Engine Room today. Uh, it's a, uh, an international nonprofit organization focused on the responsible and strategic use of data and technology. Uh, and joining me as a, a co-moderator is um, uh, Shauna Finnegan from the Association of Progressive Communications. Uh, uh, and um, we're also excited to welcome uh, four panelists based in uh, Chile, Bulgaria, Germany, and here in Brussels with me <laughs> on stage. Um, first, uh, we have Paz Peña, uh, independent activist and researcher and with the Latin American Institute for Terraforming. Uh, Lily Fuhr uh, is joining us from, uh, from the Center for International Environmental Law. Uh, Plam and Pif of Blue Link Bulgaria is also here with us and Narmeen Abu Bukhari from the EU Greens. Um, they will introduce uh, their work and how they've come to this uh, discussion of uh, uh, environmental justice uh, very briefly. But first, we just want to thank uh, Idri and Privacy Camp for hosting this conversation um, because uh, it's part of an effort to think about how we can center climate and environmental issues in digital rights discussions. So um, in terms of uh, this workshop that uh, I just came out of, what we saw there is um, that environmental justice and climate justice intersect with digital rights issues in a number of different ways. One uh, key point is on uh, surveillance and security of movements and land rights defenders um, who are uh, put into harm's way and are dealing with uh, safety concerns as they arise um, through digital uh, means. There's also a concern with information and disinformation which connects digital rights and climate justice concerns. And there's also a common shared concern around the extractive nature of corporate technology practices. And in Europe, uh, we see this clear interlinking happening with the discourse around the twin transition. Uh, which is the idea that uh, sustainability can be supported through digitization and digital innovation, something which, uh, which Narmeen also touched on uh, just before our panel. Um, the question is, is it always true that sustainability and digitization are mutually supporting? There is a lot to unpack there uh, with this idea. Um, and it's a question that seems fit for the digital rights uh, communities around the world to take stock of. Uh, the digital rights community is, of course, very familiar with the need to be critical about what kind of innovation gets supported and invested into. 
But um, Shauna and I and the rest of the panelists here today believe there's a lot we can also learn from the climate justice movement on how to resist solutionism as a common concern. So on this panel, we're calling out techno-solutionism at the intersection of these different issues. And we're taking inspiration from a framing that the justice, uh, climate justice movement uses, which is false climate uh, solutions. Technologies and narratives that can distract from the problem we're trying to solve and potentially even make it worse. We're asking what are the false solutions that the digital rights sphere needs to be aware of? And we're also asking uh, what are some of the just pathways that already exist and which can be uh, which we can way find together in order to solve climate and environmental crises. Um, so just a little note on the hybrid format today. Um, uh, we encourage the audience here as well as online to use the hashtag privacycamp23 uh, to uh, share uh, reflections and uh, questions with us throughout the panel. There will be a time to discuss those at the end. And uh, you can also join uh, Shauna online uh, through uh, their Twitter handle. Shauna, can you uh, hold that up for us? Sorry, Becky, I forgot to make the sign, but I'm gonna uh, <laughs> do it right now. Um, okay, the Twitter handle is Shauna Finnegan. Um, and uh, Shauna will momentarily share it with us. So Shauna's uh, gonna create a Twitter thread that people can respond to if you're interested. Um, so now I want to hand it over to uh, give proper uh, self-introductions from all of our panelists. And uh, let's see, the first person I will ask um, is uh, uh, Shauna, if that's okay with you. Shauna, how did you come to this discussion of digital rights and uh, environmental and climate justice? Thanks, Becky. I made the sign very quickly for anyone who can possibly read this, this terrible writing here. Uh, yeah, that's the full name. And I'm going to just put a Twitter thread in the one that um, Andrea has just created. Um, because, yeah, I'm really excited to hear what's bringing everyone in the audience and participating online to this conversation. Um, as, as Becky said, this has been a conversation that's been happening for some time and we really want it to be something that continues well beyond just this moment that we're having today at Privacy Camp. Um, as Becky said, I work with the Association for Progressive Communications, which is an international network of civil society organizations that are really dedicated to supporting individuals and groups to use technology for care for ourselves, each other, and the planet. And environmental justice and sustainability really is at the heart of APC since APC was founded in 1990. However, there's been really a renewed uh, focus on environmental justice in the last few years, um, including a publication called the Global Information Society Watch, Gizwatch, um, that published an edition in 2021, really focusing on this issue. And I know for myself, um, it was incredibly valuable to see just these really grounded perspectives of what was happening with APC members and allies and communities that, that um, APC Network is working with in terms of the real impacts of the climate crises and the ways that digital technologies are, are very much intersecting with these crises. So uh, it, as part of that work, um, APC has also been looking at uh, ways in which we can support um, environmental justice movements and land defenders. Um, and this conversation around false solutions has come up time and again. And I think um, we're really looking to how can we resist those false solutions and what are the opportunities to, as Becky said, said uh, we find those, those just pathways. So uh, that's part of what brings me to this conversation. And I'm really excited to hear from the other, the other speakers. So I'll pass back to you first, Becky, in case there's anything else you wanna add. No, th thank you so much, Shauna. Um, in that case, uh, Narmeen, if I can pass it to you. Narmeen, how did you come to uh, this intersection of issues? And tell us a little bit about what you work on. So um, I work uh, for the Greens at the European Parliament, so for um, elected uh, representative. I was first a data protection legal counsel before, so I really focused on basically data protection. Um, and then after that, I worked for a consultant consultancy agency really focusing on sustainability and tech 
as much as um, data protection. And I've realized that uh, the question of sustainability was mainly taken into account by companies. But uh, because the climate movement was influencing the discussion, so they were extremely scared of the legislative steps that was uh, taking place in Brussels. And then I changed job um, and worked for the Greens where I was the digital rights um, campaigner and I work on digital rights as much as um, climate issues. And this is where my work really focused on right to repair circular economy, but also environmental impact of different type of um, technologies. Um, and this is where also it was more of an activism um, role that I had, uh, because as a campaigner, obviously, I campaign on behalf of the Greens for a better solution for our tech um, infrastructures and um, products. Um, voilà. Thank you, Becky. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd love to hear from Paz. Paz, can you hear me? Hi, okay? everyone. Yes, I <laughs> can hear you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paz Peña, and I live in Santiago of Chile. I work as a freelance consultant, and for the last, I will say, five years, I have been researching the intersections between digital technology and the climate and environmental crisis. And I'm particularly um, interested in the social environmental conflicts of digitization and its geopolitical effects, especially in Latin America. In this sense, I work on the, you know, on the exploitation of nature by digitization, as well as the displacement and social environmental impacts experienced by indigenous populations and of course the working class. So my special interest in the issue of false solution has to do not only with the size systemic effects of digitization in the increase of consumption and energy use, but also with how these supposed solutions are built at the cost of the lives of human and non-humans in a particular situation of vulnerability, no? So in other words, what are the communities paying the price of digitization as a solution for the climate and the environmental crisis? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paz. Um, Plamen, I'd, tell us about your work, please. Hello, I'm Plamen Pev, and I'm uh, working for the Ruling Foundation Bulgaria. But uh, as we are a global foundation, you know, in many aspects uh, in terms of our interest, mostly, I'm based in Estonia, and I'm an environmental lawyer for more than 20 years. And uh, we have been working with uh, APC and also with other organizations uh, on the network, uh, net, uh, internet govern uh, governance, but also networking with uh, environmental and uh, social, uh, social rights and other uh, human rights activists so that we could bring together all the perspectives where it comes uh, to the point when we need to move forward with the uh, technical solutions and then also the impacts of these solutions uh, across various uh, fields. Uh, uh, my, uh, my perspective uh, has been in a way <clears throat> limited to the environmental field for many years, but uh, since uh, we have been working with uh, APC on different uh, issues, especially on the intersection between uh, digital and uh, environmental rights and the possible uh, potential for ex exploring the potential for uh, their uh, mutual reinforcement. Uh, that uh, brought me uh, a bit further out of uh, this uh, silo of uh, uh, environmental protection uh, work and, um, in terms of law policies and also <clears throat> people behind uh, and to see uh, how, how we could uh, uh, mutually support with the with, uh, uh, tools, with uh, experience, uh, with the uh, stories we have uh, been through in our uh, work. So there's uh, a lot of uh, to learn from each other and there's a lot we don't know about each other. So it has been really uh, maybe at the beginning of the, uh, the journey, at least for me, because uh, uh, in, the, in the past years uh, I have learned uh, not much, but I, I'm, I'm trying to learn much more so that we could uh, help each other and uh, find ways because there are many challenges, uh, uh, even with, with the good solutions related to the 
climate change uh, with the, for example, European Green Deal and just transition. There are many social and other issues, uh, technological mostly also, uh, which should be considered. So there is a, a lot of debate and a lot of uh, uh, playing field in this regard. So I'm um, excited to, to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Plamen. And we'll, we'll hear more about uh, specifically uh, what kinds of uh, frameworks and uh, just pathways you're looking at. Um, and very last, but very not least, uh, Lily, please tell us about your work. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Lily Four. I'm joining from Berlin, Germany, and I work with the Center for International Environmental Law, uh, an international NGO that works at the intersection of the environment and human rights. I'm not a lawyer, I should say. Many people expect that. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. We have many lawyers. I'm not one of them. Um, I've only been with Ciel for the last half year. Um, and, and I think a lot of what I've done before then also brings me to this conversation um, today. For um, 16 years, I worked uh, for the German Green Heinrich Böll Foundation on international environmental policies, um, focusing very much at the intersection of the environment and new and emerging disruptive technologies. And I've also been sitting on the board of an NGO that is very instrumental in the social movement space on this topic, uh, the ETC group or et cetera group that monitors new and emerging um, technologies in this space. And, and I, you know, I can, the, the, the streams that you've already mentioned, Becky, that came out of your workshop very much resonate with um, sort of the, the, the way that I've been looking at this topic and where I'm coming from, the surveillance, the extractive nature of corporate practices. Um, but in addition, so I've always been interested at this interse intersection of or we're basically powerful corporate interests on the side of big polluters, fossil fuel industries, big agriculture on the one hand, and then big tech and big data where they where they um, collide or <laughs> you know where they come together and, and intersect and maybe the other few things just to mention um, where where you know that that concern my work where that is happening is really where big um, tech companies and entrepreneurs with that tech solutionist mindset um, begin to implement so-called uh, solutions to the climate crisis. Um, for example, geoengineering, which I hope we can speak more about later. Um, and yeah, also very much the impact of the environmental impact of these technologies, as Paz has mentioned, their massive energy consumption, I think leads to a big uh, colliding of interests. And um, then one other thing that I just wanted to to flag because I think that's something that I've worked on for a long time, but that's not very much at the forefront of this discussion is where um, big companies in the agriculture space um, are beginning to really go for a big data grab to grab what is now called digital sequence information. So digitalized information about genetics of plants and species to really um, exploit them for their um, private profits. It's a huge topic that is also being discussed at the UN level. I think it's something to explore much more um, from a digital rights perspective and a question of how we deal with uh, big data. So um, yeah, very happy to be here and, and there's lots to discuss. Thank you very much, Lily. And we appreciate your perspective on climate technologies because um, the folks in this room and in the digital rights space, we're accustomed to focusing on digital technologies and now thinking about their intersections with climate and environment, there's also, of course, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, a long history of climate technology. Um, uh, there's a UN mechanism for uh, transfer of technology and the exploration of carbon capture and geoengineering. So we're really eager to hear more about that history and your perspective on how this, these discussions and investments have changed over the years. Um, so with those uh, introductions, I now want to move us to the first part of this discussion. The first part of the discussion uh, that we're going to have together is around calling out false climate solutions and thinking about what these actually are um, in relation to digital rights concerns. And then after that, um, Shauna is going to uh, take us through thinking about um, these just pathways. So, 
Um, just to come back to what, what do we mean by a false solution and why is this relevant for digital rights folks? Um, one example that has come up a lot in our discussions so far is around uh, carbon offsetting. So carbon offsetting is a practice that um, uh, first arose in 1988 as part of what's called the voluntary carbon market. And it's a way to, um, for institutions, companies, and also individuals to um, think about their carbon consumption and try to compensate for it. Um, either by, uh, through afforestation efforts, such as planting trees or restoring ecosystems. And um, over the decades, it's become a less popular idea and a more popular idea, also tool and technology. We can think of it as a climate technology as well. Um, what's interesting is at the moment, there's a lot of renewed interest in carbon offsetting. And when it comes to the digital rights space, um, this is, this is where I'd like to tie it back to some research that we at the Engine Room worked on for the last year and a half. Uh, what we did uh, together uh, in, in our organization was a research project exploring intersections between climate justice and digital rights. And as part of this, we looked at corporate tech practices uh, for both big tech corporations and uh, smaller players also in the commercial space. And what we saw often is that there are very expansive pledges made by companies around climate and sustainability targets, but not a lot of information about what's actually happening uh, behind these pledges. What we do know is that one of the most common tools uh, that is used to kind of achieve net zero, so to speak, is uh, carbon offsetting. Uh, there are other tools include renewable energy credits, uh, and also discussions of infrastructural efficiency, et cetera. But carbon offsets, this is um, what we think is a, a false solution. It's been called out by the climate justice movement for decades. More recently, we also have increased empirical evidence. For example, a study came out last week, or an investigation rather, uh, which collected a number of studies and also pulled in new evidence which showed that at least 95% of carbon offsets in the end do nothing to offset carbon emissions. These projects often fail. And beyond the failure of individual projects, there's also the larger problem of this idea that it's okay to do harm in one side of the, or one part of the world if you compensate for it in another part. It turns out that ecology and the ecosystem doesn't work that way. It's not a balance sheet where you can just, you know, balance the budget and everything will be okay. That really calls a lot into question about big tech. And it makes us ask as a group of people, practitioners exploring intersections of climate and digital rights, what does that mean for digital rights advocacy and efforts to already try to hold companies accountable? Is this concern with climate pledges something that should be integrated with concern around other kinds of digital rights harms? So with that provocation, I now want to move to, um, uh, to Lily and to uh, ask Lily to reflect a bit about this history of climate technology and uh, what it brings us to uh, today. What should digital rights folks be aware of as uh, the space becomes increasingly involved on sustainability and climate issues. Lily? Thank you. And thank you for that provocation. Um, that was already great. Um, so I thought what I could offer is um, looking back at, by now it's 30 years basically of international climate policy making, looking a little bit back at the different turns that we've taken along the way that have led us down a lot of wrong paths. Um, and that is that have increasingly narrowed down our thinking to just a few options, um, basically ruling out other alternative options and pathways that we could have taken. Because I do think, I want, really want everyone to keep that in mind that when we talk about solutions, the key question is really, what is the problem we're trying to address, right? Depending on how we define a problem, the kinds of solutions that we're going to look for are going to look different. You know, people, you know, with a techno fix mindset usually come with a solution and then they look for a problem to solve. Let's do it the other way around. Let's look for 
what is the problem? And then, um, you know, what's the solution? And looking back, really two of the driving forces along the entire pathway of false solutions in the last 30 years have been the belief in endless economic growth on a finite planet, um, you know, followed by neoliberal uh, capitalism, basically. And then um, also this uh, techno uh, optimism and the belief that technologies can fix anything and innovation uh, will be the solution. And um, so along the, along just, if, just outlining a few of those turns where we have maybe taken the wrong turn. When in 1992, the world agreed on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, right? The UNFCCC, we decided, you know, collectively, people in that convention back then, that the climate problem was going to be framed as one about emissions in the atmosphere, something very abstract, not to do with people's life. It's somewhere up there, you know, a thing you cannot touch. It's emissions. And the solution was going to be emission reductions. Well, we could have decided the problem was the fossil fuels in the ground that we were burning, you know, and the forests that we were cutting down. That's not what we decided. The problem was emission reductions. And then and then came the Kyoto Protocol, which, you know, decided on some first concrete, very small, but targeted measures to actually reduce emissions for a few countries, the rich countries. And what we decided then was going to, was that one ton of carbon that, that is emitted when you burn coal, for example, or oil or gas, is equivalent to one ton of carbon that is sequestered in a tree or an ecosystem or, you know, soil. That is actually very flawed because they're very different carbon cycles. You can ask an ecologist, a biologist, they will explain because <laughs> those cycles have different timelines. And um, so it does matter a lot. Also, the, the, the geographical location matters. The question whether you're locking in a coal mine or cutting out an entire forest matters. So one ton of carbon is not does not equal one ton of carbon. But that is the very basis of carbon trading, which was then created as a mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol. And I think what resonates with a sort of big tax mindset is that we need to quantify and measure everything. And that is something that very strongly resonated with the climate conversation back then and still today. And the next big step I think came sort of turning point and we're still in the middle of that, that curve um, came with the Paris Climate um, Agreement after 2015, where we now are talking not just about emission reductions, we're talking about net zero, we're talking about negative emissions, we're talking about the idea that we can actually pull carbon out of the atmosphere by some magical technologies um, that are going to do carbon removal for us. Um, that is something that, by the way, big tech companies like Microsoft are heavily investing in and they're counting on offsetting their big footprint of emissions by investing in, um, in, in so-called removal technologies, which are highly problematic technologies. And by the way, the European Commission has just proposed a new framework to certify so-called carbon removals from the land sector, but also from so-called carbon capture and storage and other big technologies to actually build a voluntary carbon market around these removals at the EU level, which is highly problematic. Um, so that's the next big turn that we're taking. And then there is another one looming on the horizon that we're very concerned about. And that has to do with a technology called solar geoengineering. It's actually a sweep of technologies. It's not one. But the idea is that maybe, you know, the whole thing about dealing with carbon is too complicated. There is a, you know, easier, cheap way that we can fix the climate problem by addressing some of the symptoms of climate change by turning down the temperature by taking control of the global thermostat and basically turning it down to whatever we want, 1.5 degree, you know, who wants less, let's see. So managing so-called radiative forcing, managing the level of sunlight that reaches Earth. And there are a number of technologies being researched and increasingly they're moving into outdoor experiments. Big tech is very interested. This field is full of Silicon Valley startup sort of idealists or optimists who want to go for it. And actually just a few weeks ago, a Silicon Valley startup firm called Make Sunsets announced that it had, they, they did the first rogue, so unauthorized solar geoengineering experiments in Mexico. 
um, just in April last year. Um, it just uh, was announced that they did it at the end of last year. The Mexican government now announced to ban it, but um, um, which is the right decision, I think. But anyway, so the idea that, that we should get rid of dirt or in addition to the carbon metric that is really dominating climate policy actually introduce a new metric of radiative forcing is something that resonates strongly with uh, the big tech sector. You know, make sunsets, it was already beginning to sell so-called cooling credits instead of carbon offsets. You can have cooling offsets. So that opens a, like, the door widely to a whole sweep of not just false solutions, but sort of risky technologies that have the potential to destroy entire you know, clim climate systems, including things like the monsoon, which millions of people depend on for their livelihoods and their lives. All of that is quite scary, um, and I do hope that uh, we can form and create new alliances between the digital rights movement and the climate justice movement. So I'm very glad we're beginning to have this conversation today, today here and in many other spaces. Thank you so much, Lily. I think I, I noted some reactions from the audience. This idea that the main met metric around climate change would now be how much sunlight hits the earth. Um, it's kind of where do you go from there if that becomes the main solution that we're banking on and is it even possible to or, or feasible uh, for the kind of global cooperation required to make uh, geoengineering have this desired effect and if that does get put into place is there kind of a lock-in then for you know the mid to long-term future and a reliance on, on just having less sunlight going forward. So that, that feels quite fundamental. Thank you so much. Um, now we want to ask uh, Paz uh, to reflect on uh, techno-capitalism and um, kind of challenging this idea of the twin transition that um, I introduced as being an important part of uh, approaches to innovation at the moment in the EU and beyond. Paz. Thank you, Becky. Uh, yes, I want to introduce the idea of techno capitalism instead of talking only about big techs in the understanding uh, that although big tech is a great example of techno capitalism, I believe that it is the techno capitalist ideology also adopted as hegemonic logic by most digital developments, including the developments uh, made by the states that must be fought as a solution to the climate and the ecological crisis. Basically because, as Mel Hogan says, techno-capitalism implies big data ecologies, no? So for example, the creation of an infrastructure generally placed in foreign territories, uh, specially conditioned to infinite growth with intensive exploitation of natural resources to operate. If everything is subject of datafication, uh, digital infrastructures become more intensive in their consumption of, of course, natural resources. And that intensive infrastructure um, in all its life cycle affects human and non-human communities, which tend to be, of course, the bodies that matter the least to capitalism. So this is why the false solution of the so-called twin transition is dangerous primarily as understood by the European Commission, where the competitiveness of Europe is in the global economy is by far the first priority, and where the complementary transitions are more near of a geopolitical idea than an actual scientific truth. One, because due to the indirect effects of techno-capitalist digitization, uh, we will likely have a digital rebound effect in many industries. So it is, a, at least, this is strange to seriously believe that they are complementary transitions when conclusive ev evidence is still lacking, no? But more importantly, to say that they are twin transitions is to accept that both green energies and digital technologies are the ind industries where the control of the world economy is being played out between China, the United States and the European Union. Thus, the twin transition concept is an economical concept more than a green solution, green solution, no, to to the crisis. 
But I want to return to the issue of techno-capitalism as the logic to be suspected as an approach to the climate crisis, not only looking at how big tech is portraying itself as a friend of the environment, but also um, at initiatives that have much better press in terms of green techs, but that continues with techno-capitalist logics. And here, you know, taking advance to the fact that I am in a European forum, I want to bring Fairphone into the discussion. Um, in their last book, um, Adi Kunzman and Esperanza Miyake do a fascinating analysis of the images of the Fairphone website, where magically the white bodies are the ones that repair, and the colored bodies are the ones working in mines. But of course, not any mines, socially responsible mines, according to the company. By the way, Fairphone uh, is holding a series of conversations, conversations here in Chile to see sustainable lithium extraction methods. But this green tech company, instead of first, you know, coordinated a conversation, for example, with the indigenous communities affected by this extraction, choose to ally with large German companies of electric vehicles, that is, you know, the big capital that today is part of a severe social environmental crisis here at the Salar of Atacama in the north of Chile. So if you think it, uh, it's like teaming up with Google to see a sustainable way to exploit personal data. So Eric Kuntzman and Esperanza Miyake state, and I strongly agree that we cannot reduce a social justice problem to a feel-good consumption practice of European customers. This, I think, might give us a clue uh, where we need to go in alternatives to techno-capitalism as a response to the climate and the ecological crisis. I don't want to extend any further, but I leave the conversation open for further collective reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paz, for uh, calling our attention to the contradictions of what we might consider to be even a green or responsible technology. I think it shows that there's always a way to go and that part of that is acknowledging the continued extractivism uh, that comes into play even with the devices that we might feel better about. Um, and uh, not to uh, end it on a depressing note, we are going to also explore Just Pathways um, now. But before I hand it over to, uh, to Shauna, I just want to invite the uh, online audience, if you want to engage with us on this question of what is a false solution, uh, please feel free to uh, tweet the hashtag no false solutions. <laughs> and uh, now I want to uh, hand it over to Shauna. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for those interventions, Ali and Paz. I think it's really useful to, to really frame um, our understanding as well in terms of just pathways. When we can identify what are false solutions, I think we have a much clearer idea of where, where there are real opportunities and really learning from, from communities and peoples who have been doing this work for centuries, for millennia. Um, I, I live in the prairies of, of so-called Canada and um, here in Canada and in the US, indigenous peoples and traditional communities have been on the front lines of defending ecosystems, defending the rights of nature. Um, you know, recent research suggests that 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is located on lands in inhabited by indigenous peoples. Um, although that only makes up 20% of the world's territories, it's, it's very indicative of the fact that um, indigenous peoples and traditional communities have been doing this work for so so long. Um, and actually over the past decade, um, there's research to show that Indigenous communities, specifically in US and Canada, who are resisting fossil fuel projects have stopped or delayed greenhouse gas pollution equivalent to at least 25% of the annual US and Canadian emissions, which is huge. Um, and there is a growing recognition, and I think we do need to really be pushing our, our representatives um, in different government spaces to be moving this forward. Here 
in Canada, the government has just started to develop a guardians project. There's more work to support Indigenous nations in setting up protected and conservation areas. But unfortunately, that relationship doesn't often come as a kind of nation to nation partnership. It's often still a very, um, you know, uh, legacy of colonialism in terms of the ways in which the, the Canadian government is approaching um, the relationship with Indigenous nations. So I think it's important to think about how we as digital rights actors can really be supporting and acting in solidarity with these movements, with land and territory defenders who really understand the ecosystems far better than any anyone who's just swooping in and hoping to, you know, set up a carbon offset scheme. Um, and so just with that very brief framing, I want to really uh, now turn the mic to, to Plum and to reflect on some of the ways in which environmental and, and internet governance have started to really um, find these intersections and some of the opportunities for collaboration. Plum, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. Um, first of all, I want to just uh, come back to this uh, uh, reference point uh, I was making when I presented uh, myself and uh, my background that uh, uh, the environmental rights and uh, environmental justice and now climate justice, if we could take it uh, more broadly, it has been uh, um, around for many years, more than 50 years, and has, have been developing uh, as, as, a, as a tool, a democratic tool, um, of uh, influencing the, the development of uh, society, development of uh, uh, industrial solutions. And uh, this uh, history and the lessons and the, the collected uh, uh, knowledge, but also experience in the, uh, in the field of uh, environmental protection by the environmental activists, uh, it's really very important because uh, there is uh, obviously a new era, new uh, stage of this uh, a struggle uh, between uh, between the, the, the economic uh, uh, industry interests and also the the interest of people to live in healthy environment, to live in uh, uh, in, in their places uh, where they could have a clear clean air, uh, water, soil, <clears throat> and have uh, rich biodiversity. So, in a way, uh, uh, environmental rights have been uh, really enabling people to defend their. Uh, the land, uh, their livelihood, and uh, in a way, it, uh, it was a, a, a powerful tool in the hands of the uh, of the weak weak uh, uh, part of the society. Because uh, otherwise, industry itself, we know, wouldn't be um, wouldn't be self-regulating itself in a way that uh, it will really uh, produce a positive change, uh, taking into account of the uh, public interest. So. Coming back to the public interest, I think it's a good uh, reference and uh, cross uh, reference point about uh, uh, to, to understand how, how the digital and the environmental rights could intersect. And uh, I want to just present you the example of the Aarhus Convention, which uh, has been uh, has become recently also a global uh, uh, legal in instrument, otherwise uh, was covering the countries of Europe and uh, Central e Asia, but now it's uh, uh, no, every country could uh, um, be part of to the convention. So this uh, Aarhus Convention has enabled to its uh, uh, three pillars, access to information, uh, public participation, and access to justice and environmental mat matters, uh, enabled uh, uh, all the uh, NGOs, activists, and uh, uh, just the general public in the countries uh, part of the convention uh, to, to have a stronger and uh, uh, and more powerful way to uh, to control, to monitor, or to, uh, to resist in a way to the over exploitation of uh, natural resources, uh, to to, uh, to, uh, to be part of uh, of the discussion and also decision making process uh, where the governmental uh, um, governmental authorities decide whether one uh, one or another uh, another uh, project will be uh, approved or not. So uh, this uh, convention has uh, become really a very uh, strong uh, uh, safeguard uh, for, for nature and also a benchmark for, for um, environmental democracy uh, because it uh, also links the environmental and uh, human rights and uh, also acknowledges that the, the fact that we owe uh, an obligation to the future generations 
and also uh, establishes uh, establishes that the sustainable development should be achieved only through the involvement of the all stakeholders. It has influenced uh, really the uh, policy making and also the thinking in a way of the decision making process also at business level uh, in many countries uh, because, uh, for example, Bulgaria is uh, part of the convention, European Union as a union is part of the, the convention, although not perfect uh, member, I should say. Uh, uh, so in a way, uh, this uh, international law uh, uh, over imposing these new, uh, new rules uh, for uh, procedural rights has been changing the landscape of, uh, of uh, the democracy uh, uh, at national level. So this is a really powerful instrument which could be uh, and the uh, lessons for more than 20 years of uh, 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 history of implementing of this convention has been uh, could be really an uh, important uh, reference point for any uh, conversation related to uh, how we could uh, uh, how we could uh, approach and understand and uh, in, in a way be involved into the decision making processes related also to the to the improvement on the introduction of new technologies which might be di digital or other uh, technologies which uh, have hasn't been haven't been regulated yet but anyway the, the environmental uh, law is uh, protecting and ensuring decision making processes to be uh, uh, in, uh, uh, to be uh, democratic and uh, uh, and inclusive, so that we could uh, really regulate and uh, and be uh, involved in into the decision making for the uh, development of different infrastructural projects, influencing the life of everyone. So the same way, uh, I think uh, all the new infrastructure, digital and other infrastructure of new new generation would be also uh, uh, would need also this uh, really. Uh, all inclusive uh, uh, element of, uh, of decision making process and uh, openness, uh, really full access to information, public participation, and uh, eventually yeah, as much as possible under the different uh, uh, nation uh, nation frameworks, legal frameworks, access to justice, and also uh, challenging different decisions and also challenging, in the best case, also the business in the court. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Plamen. I, I really appreciate also your, your reflection on the ways in which the, the Aarhus Convention has really sort of shifted thinking around um, these issues. And I think that's really valuable to think about how we resist false narratives. And again, as you said, the opportunities to really use this mechanism to really address that gap. As we see, there's clearly a, a concern among you know the majority of people living on this planet about the climate crises. And it's really the people who are in power who are refusing to act. So thank so much, Plum, and I think that's a really valuable example. So I want to now uh, turn back to the um, on ground in Brussels uh, to hear from Narmeen to reflect a little bit on what's happening at the EU level. Narmeen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I would I would like to shed a bit of light on how actually companies published on their website their environmental impact. You would see on Google, for instance, they will tell you how the data center is climate neutral. And this is actually an environmental claims. Um, and 57% of EU consumers are receptive to these environmental claims when they buy or use any services or buy a product. And in certain countries, they are even more receptive, for instance, Sweden or Denmark. What does it mean? It means that we have companies using a marketing strategy to showcasing how well, they are, how well their environmental footprint is, regardless on, of uh, how reliable that information could be. And because it's self-awarded by the, the manufacturers or the person providing the service or um, the products, um, we have a lack of trust from, consum for, from consumers because you can have a label or a claim that is actually real and has been um, justified and others um, which are unreliable, super vague um, and or even wrong sometimes. And because consumers like that type of information, they are being confused. Um, a Spanish consumer organization have even shown that uh, more than 43% of people do not trust anymore the environmental claims on products. 
So we have a situation where people do care about how they consume, how they, they buy, what they buy, and the, the response that companies are providing to us consumers. And this greenwashing is also misleading other economical actors. So it's not even giving the advantage to, to, the, to the people making the effort to green the product and the activities. And ultimately, that leads obviously to a less green economy. Um, I'm talking about this because I think it's a really good example on how we can create a better environment for our infrastructures and our products. The European um, Union, ha I mean, the European legislation is, um, exists on this matter, but it's mainly on the information that a company is supposed to give to the consumer. And there are two legislative texts that provide, um, I mean, that gives a legal basis to this. One of them is the Consumer Rights Directive, and the other one is the Unfair Commercial Practice Directive. And both of them um, oblige the manufacturers to actually give the information, but also forbids any misleading omission of information. Now we still have a problem, because a product can still enter the market um, we, without being justified. And that would mean that you would have to bring a complaint to the table, and that will take ages, and the product will still be on the market while it's misleading us. So we, we end, um, finally, we know that there is no obligation um, to, to provide any information on the environmental um, aspect of it. So you can't really ban uh, a green claim, and that is really the problem, and this is why you do, I mean, we believe as Greens that um, it's really important to regulate those claims and ensure that um, you don't have companies claiming what they are not, uh, claiming things that they are actually not doing. Um, recently, um, in December 2019, so at the very beginning of the mandate, the European Commission uh, put forward a European Green Deal. And this is a strategy that that aims at um, greening pretty much a lot of topics like mobility, food, housing, um, and uh, even the finance, um, uh, financing sector. But um, they decided early in 2020 to finally tackle the problem on, green on greenwashing. They first published um, uh, in, the, uh, no, in 2022, sorry, they published uh, a proposal on, uh, on uh, empowering the consumers in the green transition. And the aim was really to create an environment where you could um, publish trustworthy information on how eco-friendly a product is and give a consumer a better rule or a bigger rule. Um, to, to little disclaimer, I shouldn't, I mean, I don't believe that the burden should be put on the consumer. This is not uh, how the ecological transition should be done. Um, but creating trustworthy information obliges the manufacturers to stop producing products, infrastructure that goes against the ecological transition. And this is a, an economic way. And that is this, I mean, you can discuss whether we should use this this way. Um, but that, that brings actually a way to find company for providing information that is wrong. Um, now, what is interesting into the text is that it will pre pre-approve any claims um, that a company will put into the market, and that would have to be done by a national body. Um, and I think it would enable to avoid like Purita to come to the market and, and uh, actually have no impact on our society. I mean, positive impact uh, on our society. The second thing is that it will provide more information on the durability, the reparability of, uh, of a product. Um, and it would also uh, ban, and that I found super interesting, the environmental claims. So every claim like, you know, sustainability, eco-friendly, climate neutral, all those words would have to be proven by, um, by, um, by uh, that would be, have to be actually backed up by uh, scientists um, and um, a performance and indicator developed by the commission. So then the question is, will that uh, indicator could be good enough, and that I, I actually don't know. But it's better that at least we have an institutionalized way of looking into what companies will be able to claim or put on their website or put on their um, products uh, or what type of label they will be using. Um, in a nutshell, I think this, um, 
the, this uh, new proposal would really help us c European consumers um, have a better impact on the, on the planet, but also that would oblige manufacturers to really respect what they are actually saying. And this could be really inspiring not, from, not only from a consumer perspective, but for more general services that we have and apply to digital platform, uh, digital, platform, digital uh, services that you would have to use because this is really linked to products that you're buying, not services. Um, so we could extend uh, potentially this uh, legislation to other ways. Um, and finally have more better information for consumers, for manufacturers, and for any economic players that is um, going to enter the market uh, and not undermine the green transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Narmeen. That's really valuable to hear about these developments. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about some of the reflections that Lulu, you shared about changing metrics and thinking about some of the metrics that, that you mentioned, Narmeen, for example, durability and repairability. And you know, one of the questions I thought was, is this something because of some of the you know, right to repair campaigns that have happened in Europe that, that these metrics have gotten more prominence? And, and just thinking again about those performance indicators and, and your note, Narmeen, about the their effectiveness, it seems like there's really a lot more conversation needed to be have around, around indicators and metrics and how we really understand this movement towards um, you know, a just transition, thinking about the ways in which the pathways have really narrowed over the last decade. So yeah, thank you so much, Narmeen. And before I pass back to um, to start asking some questions. I do want to just also invite anyone who's on Twitter, if you want to share some examples that you know of, of um, you know, actions that are really contributing to just pathways for climate justice and sustainability. It'd be great to hear from you. Back to you, Becky. Thanks so much, uh, Shauna and also Nermeen for your intervention. Um, this actually brings us to, um, uh, to opening the floor to questions, both from the audience here and online. So um, yes, does anyone have a, a question they'd like to pose to the panelists? And maybe we can pass the microphone over uh, then. I see um, one hand up uh, over here. I'm uh, Jonas from the Freie Universität of Brussels, a communication researcher um, working on data protection impact assessments. So actually it reminded me quite a bit, um, I've been learning a lot from environmental impact assessments um, when we were con con conceptualizing, um, especially the involvement of citizens in uh, these impact assessments. So I'm very interested in the links between the digital rights and, the, and, and more environmental rights, but my question, um, where I really thought what you were talking about linked to the digital rights movement was um, enforcement. So um, some of the ideas that you've been just pre presenting um, about like greenwashing or forecoming greenwashing, how um, well, seeing, for example, the GDPR, how difficult it can be to enforce um, these rules. How isn't it extremely, wouldn't it, it sounds extremely complicated to enforce, um, uh, for example, what companies write on their products um, to, um, uh, to inform the consumer. So how realistic is that um, in practice uh, that these rules are actually being enforced, followed and enforced? Yeah. Um, Narmeen, would you like to answer this? Um, yes, yeah, sure. I think just like for the GDPR, it would be national authority. Then you would have to, the question of, would you really like to have consumer authority to organize this or do we prefer to have competitive authority? I mean, I think that was the same question that, had, that took place for GDPR. Um, frankly, it's, um, I found really difficult to, to know if uh, a consumer organization would be better than a competitive orga uh, com competition organization. But since it's a consumer directive, I mean, both of them are, it would make more sense than they are the one following this topic. Um, I mean, precisely on, on the, on the um, unfair practice directive, that, that, that's the case. Um, then, then remains another question, what is the financial mean that would, you would like as a member states to provide to these authorities? This is a, it's a political will question. It's uh, each national member states. Um, taking, I mean, taking it seriously and putting um, the, the the money into the national authorities, 
Um, so I would really frankly answer that a consumer organization should be in charge of this. And uh, we will see if, if, if uh, that will take in place. But then the methodology should be one that is made by the European Commission so that you have a normalized methodology beforehand that could be used by every national authorities later. I hope it uh, really answers your question. Uh, I see another hand up. Yes. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Maximilian. I'm uh, part of Degrowth Belgium. And thanks a lot for, for, for all of your inter interventions. My question would go to Lily and uh, Pass. Um, we heard uh, you sketching uh, problems, but I would also like to, uh, for you to have the opportunity to sketch a just pathway and a way out of techno-capitalism. So how do we change? Uh, how do we challenge it? And what paths should international climate policy take? Um, you spoke about paths not being taken. Lily, maybe, maybe you have a, an idea of uh, which one to follow. Thanks a lot. Do you want me to take this immediately? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so I do not have a grand master plan to offer um, to make that clear because I'm skeptical that what we need is a big master plan. Um, but that's maybe not what you're asking. Um, I think like there's so many things we could and should be doing. Um, but if I just name a few, it's really phasing out fossil fuels as fast and as completely as possible starting yesterday. Um, and that is not what we're doing at this point. And we're doing so many things that are counterproductive to that urgent and necessary phasing out of fossil fuels, including, um, you know, greenwashing in the form of, you know, calling new investments in fossil gas infrastructure clean. Um, so phasing out fossil fuels, um, and then also stopping the destruction of, of ecosystems that are still standing and, and allowing those already destroyed um, to, to be restored um, is a key one. Transforming our industrial agriculture system into something that's more just and sustainable and based on, around agroecology, for example, and diverse models. So there are many, many different things. I, I was just listening to the conversation, reflecting myself on what are the parts where I see you know, the solution paths or ways forward where the digital rights movement and the climate justice movement intersect and could really be working together. Just want to name two um, that really come to the forefront for me. One is really that the climate justice movement knows how to tackle the fossil fuel industry and lobby, right? That's what the climate justice movement is good at. That part of the movement does not really get the mindsets of big tech and Silicon Valley and how these companies operate and how we can tackle them. And I think that is what many of you, I can't see you in the audience, but I believe you know much better or that part of the movement knows much better. So I'm inviting all of you to join the fight against geoengineering and the big techno, techno fixes because we need that knowledge and we need those synergies. The other thing, um, connecting it back to the issue of surveillance um, and shrinking spaces that apparently was discussed in a workshop. We're extremely concerned about the next climate conference happening um, um, in the UAE, a country where digital surveillance is very, very strong. Um, human rights um, um, are not protected at all. Um, we already saw what happened at the last uh, conference of parties um, in Egypt. The good news was the climate and the human rights movement were beginning to work together and actually have joined communications at that last conference of parties. Not sure how that's going to play out at the COP in the UAE, but I do think that the climate justice movement at the COP needs much more support from digital rights activists, um, both in terms of concrete uh, analysis of, you know, apps that are being offered to participants of the conference, whether they safe or not, ways of communicating safely while on the ground, etc., but also actually understanding the political context of the country that this movement is going to come to for that big UN conference. So those are two concrete things that I'm hoping um, spark uh, some interest in your movement. Um, well, I have three ideas. You know, the first one, um, you know, especially thinking about what we have said before here in the, with, with panelists is um, to understand that this is a planetary issue. No? So whatever is happening in Europe, for example, any measure that you take in Europe is going to affect the rest of the world. And in this regard, I really 
you know, my, my call is actually to think about what are the measures that Europe is taking around this, especially around this greenwashing thing, etc., and how that is going to impact the rest of the world. Because this is capitalism, and capitalism is going to look for other places to extract uh, resources, data, etc. You know? And I think that is something that we need today uh, urgently address to understand that this is a planetary issue. And I think that uh, the European Union has a very important role here to think not only about Europe, but open uh, its vision to the rest of the world. That is one thing, especially you know, for Europe. The second thing is probably something that you have discussed a lot as privacy specialists, you know, the idea that we need to limit techno-capitalism, especially when we talk about big techs. You know? Big techs are not a solution for the climate crisis. No, because this idea of growth and growth and growth of extractivism of data, that means ex um, use of a lot of natural resources, etc. No, we need to limit techno capitalism. And I know that is a super complex problem, but we need to move to that direction. And the second thing is that we not only need to um, reduce the power of techno capitalism, but also to um, push public policies to have techno-diversity, no? And techno-diversity understood as the um, Chinese philosopher Yuk Hui understands te techno-diversity, no? This idea that there are different technologies that can be tied to communities, to their territories, and to their cosmovisions, no? Uh, we are facing today this totalizing idea of techno capitalism no where you know every little um, technology is tied to that uh, growth logic no and we need public policies that can fertilize uh, you know the 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 scenario for different logics of technology to appear no because this is and i i want to end up with this no Technology will accompany us uh, in this problem. No, if we want to have solutions, technology will, you know, have a very important role, but not any technology, not techno capitalism. Uh, so we need to 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 urge, you know, our uh, public policies uh, to 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 the public policy the. the uh, decision makers, no, to take public policies that can be actually um, direct, directed to have a more techno-diversity field in, in our realities. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for these last reflections and for the uh, wonderful questions from the audience. We are kind of coming on to the end of this discussion today but um, we don't want this to be the end of the discussion. And so that being said, I know there, there might have still been a couple of hands up. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us afterwards. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Shauna now for some clues about next steps and ways to continue to, to have this talk, yeah. Thanks so much, Becky. And for anyone who does use Twitter, we are collecting some resources in that Twitter thread that we've got going. Um, and if you want to, um, you know, feel free to, to direct message me at my um, full name Twitter handle. Um, and so Becky's, as Becky said, and, and I think as we keep trying to bring out throughout this conversation, we really want this to be an opening for conversations um, for people who maybe this is really new, um, as well as really continuing the work um, that we're doing um, with each other and, and with our wider networks to really address these issues. And so we're uh, working with a coalition that will be hosting some discussions at uh, MozFest at the end of March, which is, I believe, the 20th to the 24th of March. 
Um, we'll be having a few conversations there. And um, we're really hoping that this will be part of building coalitions, um, really connecting climate justice and digital rights. Um, there has been a lot of work happening that around really uh, having digital rights funders um, really engaging in work towards climate justice and supporting um, really intersectional research. And we really hope that if you're interested in getting involved, that you'll reach out to, to those of us who are in the, in the panel and um, the organizers to really think about um, how we can continue working together. Um, so I do just want to make sure that if everyone has, if you want to say any final words, the speakers, and, and then pass back to Becky. Thank you so much, Shauna, and I also uh, want to express my deep thanks to uh, all of the panelists today who engaged in this hybrid experiment with us. Um, uh, I hope it's been an enriching discussion for you all, and I look forward to continuing it with you. Uh, with that, we reach uh, the conclusion. So thank you so much. Thank you.